Welcome to the 2014-2015 Second Referee Clinic for Junior Play. This module will cover a lot of the information needed for you to serve as a second referee at junior tournaments, including the national qualifiers and bid tournaments. After the clinic, there will be a quiz which will not be difficult. All questions will be covered in the module, so please turn off your cell phones and pay attention. Let's get started. As you begin the journey to become a qualified junior second referee, you need to first remember to bring a whistle with you to all tournaments in which you are a participant. This way, you will always be prepared to serve in the capacity of second referee at a moment's notice. If you are playing in the match before your scheduled work time, introduce yourself to the first referee at the conclusion of your match. Let the first referee know you will be right back after meeting with your team or grabbing a quick bite to eat. If you are not playing before your team has to officiate, you should be at the court at least 15 minutes before the scheduled match time. When you arrive, introduce yourself and let the first referee know you are present at the court. Make sure that your teammates who are serving as the line judges and scorers are also present and ready to officiate the match. Check to see there is a score sheet and Libro control sheet at the table, along with the lineup sheets to give to the coaches. If the proper paperwork is not at the table, let the first referee know. After you and your teammates are all courtside, discuss with the first referee what is expected of you during the match. Since you are a key member of the officiating team, make sure you are present at the captain's meeting. You want to hear what the first referee says to the captains so you can communicate correctly with the scorers and teams during the match. At the conclusion of the captain's meeting, inform the scorers which team will be serving and which bench each team will occupy. You can assist the scorer in filling out the score sheet if needed or just make sure that the three X's are recorded properly. One to denote who the serving team is, the second to denote the receiving team, and the third to be placed in the first round service box of the receiving team. You should be familiar with the score sheet used during the match. Here you see a score sheet with the different sections identified. You also see that some of the sections must be filled out in ink before or after the match as appropriate. It is your job to make sure the scorer has the lineups for the first set of the match at least two minutes before the end of the timed warm-ups. For sets two and three, the lineups are due when there is only 30 seconds remaining in the time between sets. Assist the teams and first referee by making sure the scorer has them before the deadline. When you receive the lineups from the teams, look them over and make sure they are complete. These are the things to look for. There is either a number or an X in each of the Libero boxes. No number is on the lineup sheet twice. There is a coach's signature and there is a C denoting the playing captain next to one of the player's numbers and not one of the Libro numbers. If any of these are not complete, ask the coach to correct the lineup before giving it to the scorer. At the conclusion of the warm-ups, march out with the first referee and teams as shown in the clip. As the second referee, you will be on the right-hand court as you march out. If you have any questions about this presentation, View the short module at VolleyballRefTraining.com. When you get back to the score table, Pick up the lineup sheets and ask the scorer to check the player's positions on the court using the score sheet while you check their positions using the lineup sheets. After you and the scorer have checked the player's positions, let the first referee know who the captains are and ask the captains to acknowledge this by raising their hand. Motion to the Libros they can enter the court to replace a back row player if they will be playing in the first rally. Remember that if there was no Libro noted on the lineup sheet, the team must play without a Libro in this set. When you put the lineup sheets back on the table, check with the scorer and assistant scorer to make sure they are ready to begin.
then toss the ball to the first server for the start of the match. Now that you have checked to make sure that everything is ready for play to begin, get on the receiving team's side of the court and show the ready signal. During play, it is important to leave the whistle in your mouth, and when you see a fault, whistle loud enough for all match participants to hear. Your whistle must stop play and not just be heard by those near you. You also should always transition so that you are viewing the play on the blocker side of the net. To do this, wait till the players have moved away from the net and then move to the blocker side. This will ensure that you are in the best position possible to judge net contact and centerline violations. At the end of each rally, repeat the first referee's signals. During dead balls, occasionally check in with the score table to make sure that everything is going okay and the visible score is correct. In this clip, you see the second referee transitioning during play. He moves quickly and with purpose. He is doing a great job of watching the net and center line and being aware of where the ball is, so he is always on the blocker's side of the net. Notice how he is stationary when the play is at the net, so he can easily see if any violations occur during attacking and blocking actions. As you watch the clip, see that he also anticipates the end of play, so he steps away from the pole to repeat the first referee's signals. Sometimes the wrong player will contact the ball for service. If this occurs during the match, the scorer will inform you of this and at the end of the rally, whistle and indicate to the first referee that the wrong server contacted the ball. You, the scorer, and the first referee then make sure that before the next serve occurs, the players are in the correct positions on the court. If at any time during the match, any of the participants, whether a coach, spectator, or player, begins to heckle you or any of your teammates, immediately inform the first referee of this behavior. This is not appropriate and the first referee will immediately address the participant. When one team has reached 24 or 14 in the deciding set and is ahead by one point, indicate to the first referee that it is set point by placing your pointer finger on your shoulder on the side of the team that has set point. One of your primary job responsibilities during the match is to watch for net contact by players. You should see all player contacts with the net, but you should only whistle the contacts that are a fault. So what net contacts are against the rules? The rule book, or DCR, defines contact with the net as interference with play when a player touches the top band of the net or the top 80 centimeters of the antenna during the action of playing the ball. So when you see a player contact the top tape of the net or the portion of the antenna that is above the net, whistle and indicate a fault on that player. After whistling the fault, step to the same side of the net with the player who committed the fault, indicate that a net fault occurred, and then indicate with an open hand to the player who committed the net fault. Let's take a look at some clips of net contact so you have a better idea of what to whistle and what not to whistle. In the first clip, number 12 in black on the right, contacts the top tape when attempting to block the ball coming from the opponent. Since contacting the top tape during play constitutes a net fault, this contact with the net is whistled as a fault. In the next clip, watch number 4 in white on the left side of the court. After attempting to block an attack on the far side of the net, he clearly contacts the middle and bottom of the net, but not the top tape. This net contact was not whistled as no interference occurred as defined by the DCR. The next video shows a player on the left side of the net saving a ball at the bottom of the net. He contacts the bottom tape of the net as he makes the play but this net contact is not a fault because he did not contact the top tape of the net nor did he interfere with play. This is a legal net contact and should not be whistled. In this picture, you can see that the two players in blue on the left are attempting to block a ball coming from the opponent in white. There is no contact of the top tape, but the attacker in white does contact the middle of the net after hitting the ball. Although the net is obvious and it causes the net to move, this is not illegal and should not be whistled. 
By remaining stationary at the net and not transitioning till after the players complete their action and turn from the net, you will make the correct judgment and let play continue. Another major responsibility you have during play is to watch for and whistle faults that occur at the center line. In judging whether a center line violation has occurred or not, you need to know that a player may cross the center line into the opponent's court with any part of the body, including the feet. This is true only if some part of the body remains either in contact with or directly above the center line and there is no interference with opponents. In addition, Completely crossing the center line with any part of the body must not present a safety hazard to opponents. It is also legal for opponents to have contact with one another when both are on, but not over, the center line, as long as this contact does not interfere with the player's attempt to play the ball. So what do you whistle? You do not blow your whistle every time someone steps across the center line. Whistle only when a player interferes with the opponent or presents a safety hazard to any other player. And it is important to know that interference is not caused only when the player contacts an opponent. If there is a player near the body part that is across the center line, this is a fault, and you must blow your whistle. After whistling a center line fault, step to the side of the net of the player who committed the violation and indicate the fault by pointing with your pointer finger to the center line and then pointing to the player at fault with an open hand, very similar to the net fault signal you just learned. In the first picture on this slide, you see the player on the right has one foot completely on the opponent's court with no part of the foot on or above the center line, and you also see an opponent close to where the player has crossed the center line. Whistle this as a center line violation. In the picture on the right, you see the second referee on the side of the fault signaling the violation by pointing to the center line. Now let's take a look at some clips to help you better understand what should be whistled. In the upcoming video, watch the setter in pink on the left side of the net. As she prepares to set the ball, she steps completely under the net, close to the opponent's blocker. Her whole foot is beyond the center line and she is close enough to the opponent to pose a potential safety hazard. The second referee correctly whistled to stop play and signaled a centerline fault on the setter. In this next video, you see a centerline penetration that should not be whistled. From the right, number five in black steps completely across the centerline. This is not a fault because the action poses neither a safety hazard nor interferes with the opponent's play. Keep in mind that even if a player does not interfere with the opponent's, a centerline fault can still occur when a safety hazard results. How close the players are should govern that decision. The best way to ensure you see the play and judge its legality is to remain stationary while the play is at the net and not transition until all players have moved away from the centerline. By remaining stationary, only then will you be absolutely certain of what you see and be confident when you whistle a fault. Another responsibility you have during the match is to whistle when the ball contacts or goes outside the antenna on your side of the net. Of course, the line judges will help you with this. If you see the ball travel across the net outside the antenna or contact the antenna either in the body of the net or above the net, blow your whistle, move to the offending team's side, and show the out signal. After that, Repeat the signal of the first referee when he or she awards the ball to the opponent. In this video clip, the second referee sees the ball contact the antenna off the team in blue on his right. He whistles, moves to the fault side of the net, and shows the out signal. He then repeats the signal given by the first referee. There are also things you need to be aware of during dead ball periods. As the second referee, you are responsible for recognizing and whistling timeout and substitution requests from both teams. Make sure you scan the benches during dead ball periods so you see the coach request the timeout or that substitute running to the substitution zone to enter the game. Each team is allowed two timeouts per set and each timeout lasts a maximum of 30 seconds. It is your responsibility to keep time for this. 
so it would be a good idea to carry a stopwatch or other timing device with you. Each team is allowed a maximum of 12 substitutions each set and different players can go into the same position as long as that is the only position they play during that set. Let's take a look at how you handle requests when they occur. We'll start with the timeout request. When a coach or captain requests a timeout, you first need to blow your whistle. Then show the timeout signal as seen here and indicate to the first referee which team requested the timeout by pointing with an open hand to that team's bench. Then let the first referee know how many timeouts each team has taken and start your watch to time the 30 seconds. At the end of the 30 seconds, whistle the teams back onto the court. When a team has taken their second timeout, let the coach of that team know that he or she has used both timeouts. Then signal the first referee with that same information before showing the ready signal. This basic technique is the same for substitution request too. When a substitute enters the substitution zone, blow your whistle and give the substitution signal. It is important to remember that a request does not occur till the substitute is actually in the substitution zone. That is when you whistle the request. If the coach is calling for a substitution, do not whistle until the substitute is in the correct location. This is sometimes very difficult to do, since many times you hear the coach asking for a substitution. But if you continue to practice and think about not whistling until the sub is in the zone, you will get better at it as the season progresses. When you whistle a substitution request, make sure you have the numbers of both players in your head and then show the correct sub-entry signal to the players. The players must see this signal, so look at them when signaling for the exchange to occur so you know they are watching you. Then make sure the scorer has documented all the required information and lets you know he or she is ready by giving the ready signal before you give the ready signal to the first referee. Let's watch this referee administer a single substitution request on his left. When each team has a substitute enter the substitution zone in the same dead ball period, you don't want to give the ready signal till the scorer has all the information recorded, so you need to follow certain procedures. First, whistle the request when the first substitute enters the zone. Ask one of the substitutes to wait and then administer the substitution for the opposing team. After you administer the first substitution and make sure the scorer has written down all the information for that substitution, whistle and signal the request by the second team and administer that substitution in the same manner. Remember to whistle each team's request. Again, Check to be sure the scorer has all the information recorded and only then give the ready signal to the first referee. Here is how a substitution for both teams looks in practice. Notice how the second referee holds the substitute for the team in white before administering the blue team substitution. Then he whistles again and administers the second substitution. Lastly, he takes all the time he needs to make sure the score is ready and the score is correct before giving the ready signal to the first referee. A team may have multiple requests for substitutions in the same dead ball, as long as all substitutes are near the substitution zone and there is no delay in play because you are waiting for a player to enter the zone. When two or more substitutes for the same team are entering the match during the same dead ball, you need to only whistle once since it is the same team making a request. As the substitutes enter the zone, allow only one of them in the substitution zone at a time. If both subs are in the zone, just ask one to wait outside the zone while you administer the first one. When the first sub has entered the court, the second substitute can then enter the substitution zone and you administer the second sub in the same manner as the first. Always wait for the scorer to complete the documentation of all substitutions before giving the ready signal to the first referee. If the scorer is still writing, you should wait till he or she is finished. You always want to make sure you are not rushing the scorer. At the end of the match, although you want to get ready for your next match, 
there are a few things you need to complete before leaving the area. First, check the score sheet for accuracy. Make sure the scorer has completed all the necessary fields on the sheet to prepare it for the coach's and first referee's signatures. It is not necessary for you to sign the score sheet, but make sure the scores are entered for all sets and that the correct team is recorded as winning the match. If the coaches are close by, assist the scorer and first referee by obtaining their signatures. Make sure the game ball is at the score table and then thank your teammates for a job well done. The first referee will want to shake your hand and thank you for doing a great job, so don't run off before he or she comes across the court after getting off the stand. Lastly, here are a few reminders. When the lineups are turned in at the start of each set and before giving them to the scorer to record, check to make sure that both Libro boxes are filled in with either a number or an X. The captain is denoted with a C next to one of the regular player's numbers and the coach's signature is on the lineup. Remember that your primary responsibilities during play are the following. To watch for net faults, which are player contacts with the net that interfere with play, including contact of the top tape of the net and the portion of the antenna that is above the top of the net. To ensure safety at the center line by whistling any penetration of the center line by a player when an opponent is in the area of the encroachment and to whistle any time the ball contacts or travels across the net outside the antenna on your side of the net. And during dead ball periods, watch both benches so you see when a coach or captain requests a timeout and whistle a substitution request only when the player from the bench enters the substitution zone. During play, to be sure you can see the faults you are to whistle, always transition to the blocker side of the net and remain stationary there when the play is at the net. And finally, do not let any spectator, player, or coach heckle you or any of your teammates. When this occurs, notify the first referee immediately. Thank you for watching and have a great season.